you know, Apple's no stranger to architectural transitions. In fact, they've done it once before from PowerPC like this, the iBook G3, to Intel. And a lot of the tools that you're probably hearing about for the first time, like Rosetta 2 and Universal Binary, were spawned from this initial PowerPC to Intel transition. And ironically enough, the same reason they're switching from Intel to their own silicon now is the exact same reason they switched back in the day. Main concerns being things like performance per watt, and the overall heat coming out of these things. Like they wanted to put a G5 into a power book, but that was never gonna happen. I mean, you needed liquid cooling for a power PC G5. So yeah, you're not fitting that in a laptop. Either way, enough about Apple history. With every transition, like there was from OS 9 to OS 10, power PC to Intel, or Intel to M1, there's always growing pains. And so today we're gonna talk about the five things that I love and the five things that I hate about my new M1 Mac Mini. So it's been a couple weeks, I've been using this Mac Mini as my main editor, and I found a few things in you know, the purchasing experience and the use experience that I like, and several things I dislike. So let's get into it first with the things I dislike because the algorithm and Apple haters seem to go for that stuff first. So starting out is actually something that's not a use case thing, but actually a purchasing thing. And I am pricing out one that I'm gonna to buy to fully replace my MacBook Pro so that this can live a life more akin to a base model Mac. But the purchasing experience is not great when it comes to customization. Yeah, customization is not this thing's strong suit. You can go from eight to 16 gigabytes of memory, which is not great, though I will say the integrated memory directly on chip is fast, but you still need it when you're video editing and you need a lot of it, and there's just not enough here. 16 gigabytes is still not ideal. And storage is the other thing. You can go from 256, which is fine for a base model, fine for a daily use Mac that you're gonna plug a thumb drive into or an external drive, but not enough for my work, all the way up to two terabytes, which is insane and priced insane. I'm gonna fall right in the middle at one terabyte because the trade-in value of my Mac lets me do that, but normally I would probably go for 512, but I would prefer to have more options like what you have with the MacBook Pro that's currently out. Now, the second thing is port selection. Not for the reason you think, though. I'm fine with the HDMI port. In fact, that really helped considering I couldn't use my eGPU. And the Thunderbolt chips, or the Thunderbolt ports, rather, are fine. I just wish there were more of them because I have already transitioned everything over to the Thunderbolt 3 USB-C connection courtesy of having to use my MacBook Pro for so long. So I actually haven't used the USB standard hubs once, and I would rather have more Thunderbolt. In fact, if they just got rid of the regular USBs and gave me exclusively USB-C Thunderbolt hubs on the back, I would have been much happier, but you take some, you lose some. I really wish that they had more ports maybe on the next model. Now, number three is emulation support. And I know that this is sort of a not as big a deal considering that a lot of emulated apps are performing as well or better than their native run counterparts on Macs, but there's still things internally to applications that aren't supported. Things like graphical performance. I tried playing a game like Super Hot and every level load flickers and gets really weird. Even though the graphics performance is actually pretty good, it just flickers a lot and it's sort of distracting. Another thing that I actually wasn't anticipating was there is no emulation support within applications that are M1 optimized. So things like Final Cut, all my Pixel Film Studios uh, plugins don't work. They're all red text bubbles, which is not good. It means that I have to do manual tracking, means that I have to specifically run titles in Rosetta mode, and they don't perform as well in Rosetta mode as they do natively. So hopefully Pixel Film Studios will get their plugins sorted out. We'll see. Now, number four is memory management. Not that it's bad, but it's the way that it does it. And I know this sort of is a side effect of the amount of RAM that I have available, but it's still not ideal. This Mac is a swap king. This thing will swap memory out as frequently as possible, especially when you're running heavy tasks. So anytime I open Final Cut, I will see anything from 512 megabytes all the way up to two gigabytes worth of data getting swapped out to the solid state drive. What swap means is that you are taking memory that is not immediately necessary and moving it on to your storage space, solid state drive or hard drive. This is fine in small chunks, but when you're doing it very frequently, anywhere up to two gigabytes on a regular basis, you are taking 
read and write time, read and write amounts away from the solid state drive. And solid state drives have a limited amount of read and write space. So at a certain point, you may end up killing your solid state drive due to how much you're swapping. Time will tell on this one, but I think that once I get a 16 gigabyte model, we may be a little better off. Now number five will seem kind of weird, but it's the speaker, singular. It's bad, like it's really bad. And this seems like a nitpick, but you gotta keep in mind, while I hate the keyboard on my MacBook Pro, I never had a complaint about the speaker system. Those speakers were insane. So Apple has proved that they can fit a really good speaker into a very small package. Why not take that extra space that is clearly not being used by anything else in this Mac Mini and give it a better speaker instead of just retrofitting a tiny board in there using the same power supply and then using the same speaker that seems to have less fidelity than the speaker built into my iPhone. It's just not good. Alrighty, so now that the haters are happy and they know what to hate about this Mac Mini, let's talk about the things to love about it. Number one is the size. Yeah, they didn't make it any smaller, but honestly, they didn't really need to, in my opinion. It fits perfectly under my desk as is. I love the build, I love the design. I've always loved this design. The only one better, in my opinion, is the original Mac Mini with the plastic top. That just, for me, was perfect. I would have liked the space gray, but honestly, for the size, it's fine. And I think it fits perfectly in my little work area. Number two is speed. Like, it's insane how fast these things are. You don't realize what life without the beach ball is like until you're living it. Like, programs just feel like they intuitively open almost before you click on them. It, it's insane. You open programs and you wonder, did I leave that open in the background or was it just opening now? It's crazy how fast it is, not just on long running heavy tasks like video editing, but just day to day usage. Programs open insanely fast. Things scroll so well. You, you can leave tons of web pages open and nothing stutters. It's awesome. So speed, best in class in my opinion for this size of a machine and for this price point, are you kidding me? Yeah, speed's awesome. Number three is the silence. Now this thing apparently, according to rumor, has this very elusive object inside that natives call a fan and it's designed to increase airflow as the heat of the machine rises, but you'd never guess that it was in there because the machine stays that silent. Like even once you pull up a tool that shows you that there is actually a fan in there, it never ramps up. It stays at 1700 RPM, period. And I've done my day-to-day -day tasks, which are heavy at times, but nothing major, all the way up to things that I would never do on this machine. And the temperatures go up, never above 77 degrees uh, Celsius, and the fan doesn't move at all. It just sits at 1700 RPM, and you'd never guess it was in there. It never, ever sounds like there's a fan in there. It's ridiculous. Number four is the ports. Now, I just complained about the ports, but here's the good things about the ports. It's Thunderbolt, and that means that since Intel has recently opened up the Thunderbolt standard so that other companies can manufacture and use it, that means that ideally some of the things that are missing at the moment, like eGPU support, could potentially come to this machine if companies or Apple decides to write it into their software. For the general user, I think that the port selection is just fine because people will still want a regular USB port. They're not completely transitioned over like I am. Having Thunderbolt slash USB 4 does really help because if you are moving over or you want faster storage options, you can still do that. And of course, having an HDMI is awesome. Most people aren't like me and want to run two displays. So having a dedicated HDMI port to just run a singular display off of is always a win in my book for the casual user. And a headphone jack. I know for me, I use an audio DAC here, so I don't have to worry about any sort of speaker system, but most people who run a basic desktop would like to have a speaker system built in, and this would allow them to do that. Oh yeah, and I almost forgot ethernet, which I do actually use. I wire it right into my uh, little router node behind me there so that I can have a direct connection to my backups and my network storage. So that's a win in my book for anybody, but especially for me accessing local files as quickly as I can. Yeah, not 10 gigabit speeds, but I'll take it. And lastly, emulation performance. Not 
emulation support. Like I said, the emulation support is buggy at best and still getting there, but the performance for the things that do work under emulation are nuts. I am so happy that I can run programs on this thing that feel like they're running natively, even under that emulation layer. Like, they didn't have to do these BS charts like they did where they just sort of advertise their figures but didn't actually give you numbers. If they had literally just come out and said, we're getting 70 plus percentage of the native performance while emulating, I would have bought it because that's nuts. Windows hasn't figured that out yet. Like I've seen multiple reviews of the Surface Pro X where emulation speed is just abysmal. Look at that. Plus this will emulate 64 bit programs like it's nothing. Windows hasn't even figured out how to do that with their Surface X series. So that's a huge, huge feat. And that means that for the average user or me, or even some power users looking to adopt this early, you can run all of your existing programs with very, very little hit to the performance that you would have seen on your other machine. And that's it. Those are the five things I love and the five things I hate about this Mac mini. And like I said at the start, it's a transition. There's always transitional pains. This iBook G3 is a perfect example of things like that. Actually, if you want to see a video about this, let me know. I'd love to talk about this. I collect old Macs, so I've always wanted to have excuses to talk about these old computers. But either way, that's it. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to like and subscribe for more content like this. I do about one video like this a week. Uh, two if Apple announces a $550 pair of headphones <clears throat> up over there. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, make sure to subscribe, like, comment, the whole nine yards, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Make sure to be there and have a good one.